Okay, this is going to be a little bit different. This is Einstein. So I'll go to you, anti einsteiners This is pure Einstein. Modern fat <laughs> physics fallacies. You can guess what I mean by fallacies. It means exactly what it looks like. Uh, change the title a bit. The best way not to unify physics turns out to be the only way to unify physics. Okay, now, starting off with 1915, general relativity. Unified field theory is based on GR. We're almost, but never quite that popular between 1918 and 1960. Um, they were overshadowed by the growth of quantum and nuclear physics, which had no need to unify gravity with electromagnetism. Um, Relativity-based unification, as opposed to modern quantum-based unification. Relativity-based unification is usually represented as attempts to develop a single theory based on a unified field from which both gravity and electromagnetism emerge as equal partners. This is a fallacy of physics. General relativity came as such a great surprise in 1915 because physics, physicists had been trying to explain matter on the basis of electricity since the 1890s, rather than, you know, the electrons were electrically constructed, not gravitationally constructed. So everyone thought the next theory would be an electrical theory rather than a material theory. Einstein fooled them. Einstein successfully applied a Riemannian geometry to physical space, even though that idea even was 40 years old going back to Clifford. Einstein actually corroborated Newton's approach to explain matter by gravity by redefining the material basis on Riemannian curvature. That was the surprise. Not the use of Riemannian geometry. That was the surprise. Um, nor did the first attempts to extend GR come in the form of unifying gravity and electromagnetism. That's another fallacy. The first move toward unification resulted from the observation that the Riemannian geometry used by Einstein in general relativity was incomplete. Had a hidden variable or two. So the first, few, the first unified field theories were really more attempts to generalize the geometry than to extend relativity to include electromagnetism. Uh, then, but then rapidly the two, the two trends merged. <coughs> 1917, the mathematicians Hessenberg and levi Civita were inspired by general relativity to expand Riemannian geometry. The physicist Herman Weil also began his theoretical research in 1917 from a strictly mathematical expansion of Riemannian geometry. He didn't do gauge theory until 1919, two years later, in an attempt to unify. Arthur Eddington then came along. He's better known for his confirmation light bending during the eclipse in 1919. But then he followed Weil and developed a unification theory based on mathematical concept of an atom connection. That was 1921. Then the mathematician Alain Cartan came, uh, developed an alternative geometry in 1923, and he applied that to physics in 1924. This led to Einstein's attempt to base unification on the idea of parallel transport using Cartan's geometry, which included an anti-symmetric portion of the Einstein tensor in 1929. So the mathematical expansion and generalization geometry just provided physicists a convenient way to include electromagnetism in the field equations. But by doing so, they totally missed the real problem with space. And all such attempts at unification are fundamentally wrong. More fallacies in physics. They're fallacies because they won't be challenged. There are a lot of fallacies in physics now because people are afraid to challenge them. In other words, they become fallacies. Yeah, I know you got that. You just to say. Now, all these men notice that the tensors used to represent the metric uh, curvature of spacetime was located at a point in space, but only took into account the continuity of the curvature through the point, rather than any specific physical characteristics of spacetime at the point. So they're looking at the curvature in three dimensions of space. There's a tensor at that point. It doesn't say anything about what's happening at the point or in the point. So they're all missing this. Noting this fact, new geometries were developed to include the intrinsic characteristics, intrinsic characteristics of the discrete points themselves to generalize Riemannian geometry without affecting the extrinsic 3D Riemannian geometry of GR. 
So they left the refined geometry as it was and only looked at geometry in those points. So the new point or intrinsic geometries were severely limited to the points without one, addressing the point-to-point -point continuity of the Riemannian manifolds, introducing any new dimensions to space-time, or really specifying <coughs> how Riemannian continuous geometry related to those discrete points in space. Now, Paul, so Pauli later referred to these as tangent spaces because they only alter the geometry in or at the points of space-time tangent to the standard Riemannian curvature. Otherwise, they became known as non-Riemannian geometries. But even these geometries missed the point because they treated points and the metric curvature differently. They took advantage of the geometrical problem points but did not relate their solutions to the continuity through the points that was already adequately explained by the Riemannian metric that Einstein used. Now, all the connected different geometries, both the Riemannian and the non-Riemannian, were the individual discrete unconnected points, whereas connections should be through all points in the different spaces, both manifold and embedded, consecutively and simultaneously. In other words, it should be like this. The three dimensions of curvature, then this. They had this, and they still didn't tie what's in the point here. They gave reality. The tensor before this was just a symbol. They gave that symbol meaning in the point, but didn't connect it to the curvature. That's the non geometry. I'm just a little bit at sea about the bay. Who are you referring to when you talk about the work about the discrete geometry? Who's Levi Chavita, Essenberg, <coughs> Weil, Eddington, Einstein, just the ones I mentioned before. But the, these, the these are people who are all considering the curvature tensor as a function of the of the points on the manifold. Mm -hmm. So, but so no I don't understand what you mean the by they were ignoring the entire. They were only working in the tangent space. They're only working in the tangent space, right? At one point, you mean? At point up until but, I took but, it. But, but this point is the tangent. The tangent space at that is a function, is a matrix or a 2D matrix or whatever, which are all each element of which is a function of the point. Mm -hmm. So as you move the point, you get a different. Yeah. Right. You get a different yeah. Right, so they, they're yeah. not ignoring They're not ignoring the continuity. I didn't say they're ignoring it. I said they weren't relating it to the continuity the way it no. should have been. Well, you can disagree. Let me finish my thoughts. Okay. Next. On the other hand, Clues has sought to solve the same problem uh, of unifying GRDM in 1921 by assuming that the four-dimensional space-time continuum was embedded in a five-dimensional manifold. Yet he made the same mistake. He didn't tie the points to each other in normal space-time. So this is what he did. Basically, these are points, points in space. He put little loops on them like this. There's your three-dimensional space-time, and the fifth dimension would be up. But figure this is no space between these individual points. But along this loop, they're not connected. This loop isn't connected, that one, that one, or that one, any surrounding it. Although he called this a cylindrical condition, because if you put it in a space-time diagram with the fifth dimension, you'd have the world line, and you'd have loops like this, so they form a cylinder. It's, it's, you can see it more easily here. But they weren't connected anywhere except through there. They weren't connected in the higher dimension. Then comes along Oscar Klein. 26 and 27 later, he expanded the republished of extending this to include quantum. He basically quantized those little loops. He noticed the eighth line, the little loops are called those lines, they're called A lines. Uh, he noticed they formed a periodicity that could be quantized, and thus the Clues Klein theory was formed. He did not, as, as a lot of superstring people tell you, he invented cylindricity. No, cylindricity was inclusive before Klein ever took it over. Inclusive Klein is not hyphen in a single thing. They're two people, they're different people, they never work together, and according to uh, Clues' son, they never even met. They never published anything together either. But Klein's quantum model just continued the closure problem of individual points by having a loop the higher space, the points were closed. 
um, and not the complete embedding manifold or that space uh, Calusa's original model suffered from. The A lines were not continuous with each other at all points along their extensions. So Klein's quantum model was incomplete because Calusa's model was incomplete because general relativity was incomplete. Now we have evolution, different evolution theories. Here are, the, here are different hyperspace theories and their relationships, and, but they're extrinsic curvature. You have the intrinsic curvature theories. Here's the Einstein long line leading to where I'm going. Then you have the different theories here, miscellaneous, and these are the atomly connected spaces. They're all related to you, but all these come together in 1945 in trade, with Schrodinger's work. Actually, Saxby did it independently. And then Einstein went with a non-symmetric model that he'd done in 1925, but these are equivalent. So since Einstein's later non-symmetric model that I ended up with in 55 was a continuation of all this. There's another complete line of five-dimensional spaces that no one but me has ever heard of. And that's with Flint and his followers in England, at the University of London. There's a whole line there. Flint did everything. He quantized it and everything. No one ever heard of it. But I'm not going to get into him today, that's another story. Now, Einstein worked on the non-symmetric model until his death in 1955. But the calculations from his non-symmetric model for moving charged particles always yielded values that were too far, or far too small, infinitesimal, and many by many orders of magnitude to account for electromagnetics. In other words, the non-symmetric was supposed to be electromagnetism, non-symmetric part of the Einstein tensor. But the values he got were way, 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 way too small and didn't matter whether they're charged or not to boot. That's important. I'll come back to that later. Oh, well, I guess I'm going to do it now. There's a very important reason for this discrepancy. It's due to the fact that Einstein and others were working towards unified field theory. They're working with an incomplete geometrical picture of space. And um, the manifolds, the embedding manifolds, that did not include both point and extension metric as equal connected geometrical points. <coughs> In other words, the same point extension or discrete continuity problem exists in mathematics and geometry. It's missing from Riemannian geometry, the original, all the way back to Riemannian. It's missing all the way back to Euclid. And it's a problem in mathematics right now, the infinitesimal problem. It's across the board. Um, science has been based on math fallacies for over two millennia. All geometry is based on mathematical fallacies. Many science only saw that geometry was incomplete when GR was developed to try to take advantage of that incompleteness, developing the non-Riemannian geometries and tangent spaces. Then there's another group that actually looked at that a little bit, and those are called pseudo-Riemannian geometries. So there's another set of geometries in there completely. But no one actually tried to attack the real central problem of how discrete points could also be re represented in continuously extended physical spaces. How can a discrete point both be both discrete and continuous at the same time? That's still a problem. Even on the in arithmetic, on the number line, that is still a problem. One of the primary problems, according to a recent article by a mathematician. There is an answer, the answer to this left. Physical space is dualistic. It requires both extension as well as point expression. Electromagnetism expresses both. Electricity is a uh, point ex is a uh, extension metric, whereas magnetism, with the magnetic vector potential, is point. So it expresses both. But gravity only has metric extension, both Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity. Therefore, gravity theory is incomplete, and two forces cannot be unified by wrongly using gravity's non or anti-symmetric tensors components for electromagnetism because they're Einstein only expressed half of gravity, so it's mm -hmm. so all present gravity theories are fallacies because everyone just assumes without question that they are complete. And don't even get me started on the quantum theory. Did you notice did you notice parallels here with quantum theory, the difference between discrete and continuity? It's the same thing in quantum theory. You solve that in the unified quite easily. In any physical uh, theory of reality, 
there are only two points of any consequence. I mean real, Lloyd Pascal, whatever. Center of mass, or center of gravity, and center of rotation. I think Peter also mentioned those. Those are two real infinitesimal points. So we have to have a real theory of infinitesimal points just to account for those two. Well, how can you say the center of mass is a real point? The center of mass is obviously an average calculated from some nice. density functions that is but a if it didn't mathematical exist, abstraction. It's there. It works. It works in the physics. It's not from mathematical abstraction. There is an average. There is a point. Are you saying there's no point that is the average? I'm saying that there is a point, an infinitesimal point that is the average. If I take the average of people's height in the United States, I don't get a real person. <laughs> no, but you do. <laughs> but that's not, those are points. I said there are only two in reality, center of mass of gravity and center of rotation. Metric spaces only account for center of uh, mass or center of gravity. They don't account for center of rotation. I think Peter said something, something along that same line earlier. Um, this accounts for all point particles in quantum theory. Oops, I think it's too good up there, didn't I? Okay, I did. This also accounts for all point particles in quantum theory and eventually unifies classical physics in the quantum. The non-symmetric portion of the Einstein tensor used in unified field theories has absolutely nothing to do with electromagnetism because it represents a purely secondary effect <coughs> of gravity due to the dualistic nature of space. Now, John Moffat, who is presently uh, What's the place he is up in Canada? I, Toronto, is it? Yeah, they'll try. I can't remember the institute up there. Pyramid Institute? Pyramid. Perimeter Institute. Perimeter. 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 In 1979, he came to the same conclusion, but from a different point of view, that the non-symmetric portion tensor was about electromagnetism and stopped dark matter. And the only other ones who are presently seem interested in this type of unified field theory are historians associated with the Einstein papers. Uh, Dillman Sauer and those that bunch. A German historian by the name of Hu Hu uh, Hubert Goner, I've read some of his papers, but that's all historical. And there's a physicist down in Austra Australia called uh, Boo B. Ho. He did a paper in 1995 deriving the Yukawa field from unified or from general relativity. And James Shiflett um, did a PhD dissertation in 2005 on it. And I haven't found anything recently since his PhD dissertation on this. So this area of physics is almost completely ignored by the scientific community. Now the Einstein metric tensor in classical GR should have two parts, the symmetric and non-symmetric, due to the dualistic nature of space. If space, is, if space is dualistic, then gravity also has to be dualistic. The symmetric portion yields space-time curvature to explain Newtonian gravity, while the non-symmetric portion, which was thought wrongly by Einstein's and others to explain electromagnetism actually predicts what is now called dark matter and dark energy. That is why Einstein's 1952 calculations using the non-symmetric tensor were the same whether he charged the particle or not, and that's why they were infinitesimally small compared to electromagnetic. Because he wasn't calculating 1952. He's calculating the speed of Voyager leaving the solar system and having a few meters per second extra speed. Or he is calculating the speed of a satellite doing a slingshot around the Earth that picks up a, you know, several centimeters per second extra speed. That's due to dark matter. Dark matter. <coughs> and that's what he actually calculated in 52. He could have predicted dark matter and dark energy then if he wasn't so intent on using that to explain electromagnetism. Now this means that normal baryonic matter is the source of all astronomical phenomena, both local and non-local, associated with dark matter and dark energy. Einstein's uh, non-symmetric tensor has nothing to do with electromagnetism, but merely expresses a normal point geometry of space, dark matter, or dark matter is non-local curvature, and dark energy is what I call the gravimetic vector potential. On that moment. So basically what I'm saying is, you connect these points, you can only do it using five-dimensional space. So now it accounts for the continuity through the point, as well as the characteristics of space at that point. You get one in classical 
uh, hypermagnetic theory, hit the magnetic vector potential. That's why you can't measure the three-dimensional space. It's actually pointing to the fourth dimension space or the fifth dimension space time. And the, gra the gravitonetic vector potential, that explains dark energy and inertia. It's dark energy outside the limits of a particle. Inside the particle, it's inertia. Now this actually replaces the need for a Higgs particle because it's point by point by point and what's the Higgs particle's point economic mass. You have the metric curvature like this and then you have all the points in it. The points in it are the inertia. The metric curve is gravitational mass. A new simultaneity. That's a new simultaneity, principle of simultaneity. Now the gravimetic or gravitational and magnetic vector potential is not intrinsic to the curvature at discrete points in space in the non-Riemannian tangent space like fashion, but rather imply that curvature must be extrinsic. This all implies that you need a fifth embedding dimension. So you have to go right back to Riemann and look at that fifth embedding dimension. That hyperspatial structure, or at least an over-restricted abbreviated part of it, already exists in Clues' theory. 1921. Now Einstein actually saw this problem with Galuz's model. He, he attempted to fix it in 1938 with Bergman, but he didn't go far enough. And this is a diagram from their 38 paper. This is our 4D space time. You put a parallel 4D space time at some distance r0 from it. They proved mathematically that the physics in this four-dimensional space-time plane are equal to the physics in this four-dimensional space-time plane. And they left it that. They didn't say anything about this fifth dimension. Is it closed, open, what form does it take? Had they done that, he could have unified physics right there. Now, Peter, here's our normal space. That's your red vector. Or if you want to look at it, uh, this is Rauscher's and Tiller's eight-dimensional spaces. There's a four-dimensional space. There's your other four-dimensional space. That's four-dimensional space that you would put off and everyone else would put on. Oh, Randall Sunder. Take Randall Sunder. I like there. your concept that you got this free space. But you have to, if I'm measuring this free space, I have to have another dimension to come down to put my ruler on. Yeah, in a sense that's the other it is. And so really it's a five-dimensional <coughs> if you include time. It's also an, uh, it's also a Gödel's theorem. Because you can't go to a higher space to actually define the lower yes, space. Right. So I also throw that in, not in this one, but I throw it in elsewhere. Now Einstein reasoned that individual points were closed in Lewis's 5D space. Individual points were, but the whole space was not in that model I just showed you. The higher dimension is closed as a whole with respect to four-dimensional space-time, but they did not determine how it was closed or what effect that closure would have on a normal 4D space-time continuum. And when they did this, they kicked out Klein. That had nothing to do with Klein because those were macro that R0 is macroscopic. So they've thrown out Klein. He comes back later to haunt them. It seems as if physics is played with half solutions and half measures everywhere you look. Yet their model implies that an infinite number of parallel 4D space-times constitute specific thickness of such elements can exist without changing the physics of 4D space, our normal 4D space-time. And what is done along that fifth direction affects the physics of four-dimensional space-time. So all of the 5D or greater models of space-time are incomplete because they're based on a simple geometric fallacy that space can be modeled by simple metric or extension-based geometry, either MG Newtonian or GIK, Einstein graph uh, tensor, even though space has two distinct parts, point and extension. Einstein Bergman implied that you cannot just extend on the connected discrete points individually into the higher dimension. You must extend the whole of the continuous lower dimensional space point by, you have to extend whole space point by point to, for the continuity to work into the higher dimension and close that extended model to the lower dimensional space. So the one and only solution to this problem was implied by Einstein Bergen in 1938 as well as by Riemann himself in his 1854 uh, dissertation. 
but it wasn't published until 1868, on the differential geometry of surfaces. So the geometry of embedding dimension must be completely specified to guarantee the continuity of dis uh, discrete points in three-dimensional space with all other discrete points in three-dimensional space across the whole of the embedding dimension. Now this, this is a talk I gave two years ago at London. If you just have one dimension 3D space and you continue up a little bit around, this is essentially what Einstein and Bergman did. They did it like this but didn't say how it was closed in the upper space. The only way to close that in upper space is to bend. You've got one dimension curved in the second dimension. That brings these loops. The loops, according to Calusa, they have to be of equal length and come back to the points of origin. That's a cylindrical condition. So this has to bend so that these two can meet right there. Then you take this and you expand out to these two points and points, and you build basically a two-dimensional spherical space, you want in space. But the fifth dimension or fourth dimension of space, fifth of space time, is closed, but it is single polar. Our three, our three dimensional space is double polar. <laughs> so that if you go on circuit from here, up here, and back here, it's like a Mobius strip. And things get reserved, the reverse. That's half spin on particles. That gets, that's what gives particles half spin. So this structure yields double polar remodeling 3D space the same physical characteristics such as symmetries, translations, and rotational motions because it's got that twist on it. I'll call it twist like, like um, Clifford did. That allows us to have centers of rotation with twist. So I've, that takes care of our three-dimensional space. Our, our commonly experienced 3D space is better than the higher single polar remodeling manifold. Without that twist, we can't have rotations in this dimension in our normal space. Individual points in 3D space can now remain discrete within 3D space, but they're continuous because they're connected at the single polar point. So now we have some conditions for any theory, unified field theory. We have all A lines are closed with respect to their, their origin points, and all A lines must be of equal length. That's the relaxed cylindrical conditions. I call them the Clifford conditions because this is the type of space he envisioned in his work in 1873 and afterwards. The one-dimensional A lines must be at least as long as our normal 3D space is big. That's macroscopic extension. In other words, the higher dimension, embedding dimension, is as big as our normal three dimensions of space. All A lines must pass through a single common point. This is the single, this is called the single polar Riemannian sphere. And then the Einstein condition in his uh, Meaning of Relativity, which was published, written before he died, published the year after he died. Any theory of this type must explain why we do not observe the higher dimensions. Well, why don't we? Because we're stuck in that, they all matters in that single sheet at the bottom. Matter does not extend. That's a higher dimensional extension of matter. It's not matter itself. So we can't think in that higher dimension. That's my next talk if I get time to it. Now, there are also some general rules of unification. Since there are two parts to space, point and extension, to our commonly experienced three-dimensional space, classical or Newtonian gravity must also be affected as are electromagnetism and quantum. The extended part quantum would be your quantum field Higgs field, whatever you want to call it. And then the points are specified to quantum theory. So quantum theory is going in the same direction. When you do this to a classical unified field theories, quantum theory and unified field theory in this manner, they're converging on each other. Anything that happens along the embedded dimension happens in the embedded dimensions. So, while non-symmetric point geometry portion of the Einstein gravity tensor yields dark matter and dark energy, instead of electromagnetism, as Einstein's and others originally thought, dark matter and dark energy cannot be logically understood unless a four-dimensional space is used. <coughs> that that four-dimensional space pops right out of this. Now, this is this is the example for dark matter and dark energy. 
This is a geometrical explanation. This, this was six years ago at the PIRT conference in Imperial College. <coughs> this is your mining curvature of space. Here's your galaxy forming from a nebula. It spreads, it forms first in the center and spreads outward like this. But it's three-dimensional. This is three-dimensional and this is three-dimensional universe. The three-dimensional surface of our universe of positive curvature. But the galaxy is much stronger locally. So it, grow, it should grow out tangentially. Not, there, there's not enough attraction from the rest of matter in the universe to pull that down. So it actually grows out like this. Well, sort of. <laughs> so what you'd have, you'd have galactic core and rim, tangential point of its center. But it has to be continuous with normal space. So normal space would end up like that. That leaves a dimensional gap in there. But that's not what we observe, is it? What we observe is no dimensional gap. And the galaxy is pulled down to give you this. There's your halo. Galaxy is pulled down to a three-dimensional surface. This is the Einstein radius of the universe. You can actually do some calculations. I calculated for Andromeda galaxy that gap at the end of the galaxy would be like exactly one half light year, very close to one half light year gap. What pulls it down? It absorbs dark energy from the rest of the universe. And as it absorbs dark energy, in other words, the rest of the universe sort of like gets sucked in, bringing dark energy into it. That dark energy then is added to these speeds to bring them down, giving constant speed throughout the, throughout the spiral orbs. And to see that geometrically, how did I get there? I just did that. What the black well, I just said that. So this is what this is this is very idealized. This is hand drawn. This is very idealized. The curves we see are something like this. There's variation here. But it's as if there's another another core out there equal to this core, giving those constant speeds. So it's like a shadow port, but it's not really there. It's due to the, that non-local curvature of space that I just showed. This is normal gravity, would be something like this. But if you take that in the Newtonian equation, which I'll give you a minute, as mv cross gamma, where gamma is the curvature of the rest of the matter of the universe, collectively, and change that mv to kinetic energy, one half mv squared, you get an inverse relationship to v. Now this D is due to the center core. So this D, this D would be along this curve. But if it's inverse rate relation here for energy, the graph is a straight line out here. You add these two together and you get this type of curvature for your galaxies, the galaxy arm, which is approximately, now there's a lot of variation depending on the galaxy. And as I said, I calculated for for Andromeda and this gap, that much dark energy. This is basically the amount of dark energy added right here. That's a distance that should be one half light year. So it's that much dark energy coming in to speed up those outer, uh, outer arm planetary systems. So what we have then, a new equation. Not so new. I looked it up myself. Then I figured, well, that's so simple. Other piece of people must have done it. Got it. Google. A couple hours, I found something called the Heaviside Equation. Presently used for gravito-electromagnetism theory. Yeah. But they don't think much of it. Well, they don't think of much of it because it's totally misinterpreted. If you go back and wait and interpret this in the sense the way Heaviside did, that this is actually a centrifugal force from the rest of the universe <coughs> pulling outwards, equalizing everything. Heaviside had it right. The GEM modern theory got it wrong. So basically, that's Mach's principle. That's, a, that's, that's a, actually a discussion of Mach's principle. Now, since this is three-dimensional, that's three-dimensional, the cross product has to throw a vector someplace, goes into the higher dimension, the fourth dimension of space. And this explains both dark matters, I just showed geometrically, and dark energy. But then, this gets incorporated in here as lambda CDM in a tensor equation. Because a tensor equation, remember I said, Einstein tensor is just based on metric, not on point. So you put the point in here, and that gives you lambda corresponds to this. 
And so basically then you have this energy stress tensor equal to a Einstein tensor with a symmetric and a non-symmetric portion. And I just use the hat to say the tensor splits it into two parts. Now, gravitoelectromagnetism, as well as the torsion people, torsion people also use the anti-symmetric tensor from Einstein's 1929 to explain torsional space, a fifth force of uh, fifth force of nature. But it's a misinterpretation. They they say they say with the torsional field people say that you can use that torsional field, the anti-symmetric and non-symmetric tensor, to calculate even from a fast falling elevator. Or are they actually calculating the fast falling ele elevator? The dark energy, dark energy contribution for it moving at speed v relative to the Earth, which is the center for the gravitational field, the mg field. OK. Now, Fine's idea that quantification of fifth, fifth dimensional will quantize lower four dimensional space time is valid. But he's working from Palouse's theory, which is grossly incomplete. But only under the new conditions. Now this gives us a completely different thing. We have stacked sheets. The quanta are stacked sheets, like pages in a book. It's really the density of a single field in fifth dimension. The density increases exponentially, going away from our normal space, up around to the far reaches of that single pole in both directions. But now you have sheets. The sheets have an effective width, not a true width, an effective width. And that is where the quantum comes in. So basically, that structure would look like this. Here's a drawing I showed you before, but now you put another, that second loop in the Einstein Bergman, you put that on top, and that encloses the loops. This has an effective width right here. That's the n equals 1 principal quantum number. The next sheet would be the n equals 2, and so on. Here's a simpler view of it. These were the sheets. Uh, this is Einstein Bergman again. And you have, those are the loops, point, point, loops, say be like this. And so I'm just enclosing that. Or if you want to think string theory, I'm just enclosing between these two sheets. This is not a real line. <coughs> it's just a quantum. This is actually continuous in higher dimension. <coughs> this would be the n equals 1 principal quantum. And I'm including the Colby-Yau so I can include superstring theory in this. Because everything Colby-Yau does, you can do in that effective width. This is from 1980. This is the way I drew it in 1980 in my master's thesis. Uh, the dots do not represent particles or anything like that. They just show the density of space in fifth dimension. So this sheet with the effective width just folds here. That's the effective width. There's, it forms a cusp, or it doubles over. That cusp is the quantum, in, in essence. L is a photon, or the point, of the frontal point of an approaching light wave, spherical wave. Uh, and it probably, I'm assuming that it, this, is, it have, this is the densest part of the field, then it decreases the density going this direction and this direction exponentially. So this quantizes space-time curvature and unifies all of gravity. And this is a summary of all that, with all the equations and everything for you to look at. Uh, that's the one I gave you. Now, what can I do with this? Well, this is what I call unification. I'm also a historian of science as well as a physicist. And you go from Clifford Einstein, all these different things, even get over to Randall syndrome, or implying something like this. But eventually, we're going to end up with one single field theory. Call it Higgs. Field, I don't care. <coughs> Same difference. But it's a single field. And it will unify gravity, general relativity, in a way, if not the way I did similar to that, and the quantum. But it's coming down to single field theory, and it'll be the hyperspace continuum. Now, the thing is, if you go back up to that last one I showed you, here, this implies there's a sixth dimension. It doesn't imply it, I don't know anything about it. Now, what happens is, Pauli criticized Calusa's theory, saying he added in the, um, the electromagnetic intensive forms into his five-dimensional structure from outside, so he can, didn't consider it valid. But I'm not doing that. From the sixth dimension, you split along point and extension. Point is weaker, extension is stronger, much stronger. 
So that's the gravity tensor and the electromagnetic tensor. In five space, they may be written like this. This is just the electromagnetic field in tensor form. Einstein here, the non-symmetric part, symmetric, non-symmetric part. Metric part, point part, metric part, point part. And then that's the hepatocyte equation. With all, with all the various characteristics, and you break it down. Here we have, th this curvature gives you dark energy, but if you do uh, del dot gamma is equal del dot del cross i equals zero, i right there, that's for inertia. That is, as I said, the points under the curvature that are uh, just inertial mass, inertial mass. And that's my equivalence for example. I said simultaneous. So I'm long sleep here. But this is grab, grab electromagnetism. I don't want to call it gravito electromagnetism, so instead I call it gravito gravitism. Mm -hmm. This is the historical, all the historical stuff. Here's a much better drawing of a particle five-dimensional space. This is the effective width. You'd see it as a sphere in three-dimensional space, but it looked like a cone with a quantum gap on it. quantum gap up there is the neutrino. That's what keeps it from. And then because the that is expanding, it's trying to stretch. Not because it is expanding, because it is expanded. Even if it's instead of expanding as contracting space, it's still be pressure up there. That pressure is pulling on the cap, which is causing a stress inside here, which is seen as a strain here, and that's the electric field. Then gravity field um, includes this here. You've got a pore transformation. Pore transformation is just taking a cut here, and so you've got this and another particle here that pull up. That's why gravity is always attractive. Since this is pulling up here, a cut transformation gives you an electric field. Inclusive theory. So those work from Clues' theory. Then an electron would just sorry. Electron would just be a little hump that hasn't broken up because there's not enough there, so the, the overall curvature space is pressing down equally, giving it negative charge, and then with equal stresses. Antiparticle, this would be an antiparticle on the bottom side of the sheet, on the inside of the curve. You call it potential. You have shell model and fluid model of a nucleus. You can't put them together. One structure, one spherical fluid. Nope. If you stack them, your shell model is the stacking in the fifth, fifth dimension of space time. And they appear around here. And each particle, proton, neutron, proton, <coughs> neutron, proton, neutron, stack, would look spherical to our world and seem to be a, a fluid, fluidic. So I've just unified the shell and fluid models. And that this curve right here, the curve where they come together, is the Yukawa potential. And if you do, but that's over the, the areas, the surface areas of those curves. Surface area, surface area is Yukawa potential. But if you do point, 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 point to point, that's the electroweak. Because again, space has those two components. Here's an atom. One model for the atom based on space time curvature. There's a nucleus I just showed you. And every time it drops down here, one effective width here, you get the n equals one hydrogen shell. <coughs> that drops down, it goes out four times the width of the atom, or the radius of the atom. Drops another, you get the n equals two. It goes out three times, from here out three times the um, or the radius of the atom, get the n equal 3, because that's a drop of one effective, one effective, one effective. They eventually you get out here so far, you can't tell the difference between these and the curvature. And let's, you, you, you have copies of these for that. Then finally, this is a graph, greatly, greatly, greatly exaggerated. Because, well, in your version, this is the old version, in your version I say here, this is about 10 minus 0, if I say this is 1, that point would be about 10 to 40 up there because the electrostatic force is so much greater. But the gravity out here, and then it goes real steep in here, inside. This is the radius 
can do this than the electro electric force. This is an external electric strain. This is the internal electric stress. And then I think, I'm pretty sure that the effective width would be the uh, fine structure constant times the radius of the, of the, of the proton. Then a neutron is exactly what you see this. It's a proton, electron together with a quantum cap, which is a neutrino that comes out when you decay. But this is what this is what I like to explain with it. Finished. I'm looking at this sheet here. Um, you know, I quite like the sort of symmetries between the electrical and the uh, gravitational. You know, you put the same formulas, etc. down here. Now, if, if that is the case. Shouldn't the electron charge dilate with what velocity as a mass dilates with velocity? Do you know what? No, it doesn't, because that portion, <laughs> this portion here, this constant, what happens as the say, say proton is moving, electron, many charged particles moving, the Lorentz Fitzgerald contracts. When it contracts down, if, if, if while still contracting down right, and it hits another proton, say, you don't see anything. It's just a classical connection. But if it <coughs> down the direction is traveled, if it contracts down, if it contracts down to this width mm -hmm. and then hits another proton, you see the stresses inside the electrical stresses inside the pro the other proton split up in thirds. Negative one third, negative one third, negative one third, negative one third, positive one third from the collision. There are your three quarks. The do the lens for zero contraction and not three separate particles. But this part doesn't contract. Only the outside contracts. So it only set the same charge. Uh, how does quantum measurement work in your model? Pardon? How does quantum measurement work in your model? Like, what is oh, that's, the, that's too no, what does the double slit experiment look like in your model? Uh, it'll be the same. I've redefined the quantum that this actually incorporates particle theory. It's just that the only real particles are ones with half spin. All the others are just intermediate particles until they break up into real particles. But I can take the whole, the way I set that up where I showed you the Higgs particle and everything is, I can more or less bring in the whole standard model. Yeah, but, but, but what I'm wondering is um, about it wouldn't make any difference in the quantum interference effects. Um, do you have models for particles which are these extended things in space time and maybe there's a geometric picture of how those interference effects occur using your model. Yeah. Yeah, but it wouldn't change the way it's seen in any way other than explain the present. Like I say, this incorporates I, all I've done in quantum theory is I've changed the philosophical interpretation of it. I haven't changed it, and that allows me to incorporate it in here. I hinted at the way I do it. It's really extensive. I mean, I've written two books on this. They're e-books if you want to buy them from Amazon. But most, I've got like 66 papers now in academia.edu, 44 presentations. So you can look up all this stuff. I've been doing this, like, for this stuff, this really good stuff, just in the past 10 years. So you look up all my papers, and I explain more of those other papers. But I do take a gap measurement problem. It's just a, it's a, a lot more long, convoluted explanation. Where, where do you find your papers? Academia.edu. Academia.edu. <laughs> and then I also have a web page, Neurocosmology. Neurocosmology.net. That's, that's my web page. I'll have a few things on that aren't at academia.edu. Academia.edu is one of those sites that's countering uh, archive. I've been banned from archive. <laughs> yeah, well, so I have everything in it. Yes, David. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Okay. I'd like to make a comment. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm not asking a question. It's about this discreteness and continuity thing. And uh, now, I'm, I'm saying what, I wasn't even considering that question, but 
bit. If its space is fundamentally discrete, and yet it is non a non-conserved quantity, then that discreteness has to be reconstructed endlessly. Which looks like continuity, but it isn't yeah. continuity. Endless reconstruction isn't continuity, but it's got all the other aspects yeah. that continuity. Actually, think that and, and that's what I would say is, is the reason for why space is discrete and continuous yeah. kind of thing. But, as I said, that's a sheet. That's either expanded, expanding, or contracted. It's expanded dip, which means it's got that pressure to get yeah. charge and everything, and gravitational. But, how would the fourth dimension expand? It wouldn't expand all in one direction. The bottom and top, the bottom of the curvature would expand in this direction, top and down. So one's like positive dark energy, and one's like negative dark energy. Wait, I'm not talking about that. That would be your reconstruction. I'm just talking about space. Just yeah. space as a, as a concept. Endlessly reconstructed. So. Well, I'm saying that's the endlessly reconstruction. Yeah. that expansion. Yeah, but going saying, opposite from different sure, directions. That's your particular model of yeah. how you would explain that. I'm just saying that as a concept about space yeah. makes sense of its continuity and discreteness problem. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I'd, say, I'd say that is an internal three-dimensional interpretation. Because Einstein's problem, I'm not going to get time to do my whole consciousness thing, but Einstein's problem, he said, unless we can detect this, we can't detect this because we're using three-dimensional instruments. We can't detect this higher space. We have all kinds of evidence of it. Um, de Broglie's pilot wave, the longitudinal wave from electromagnetism. They're the ones that had, you know, as the wave travels out three-dimensional space this way, transversely, there's a portion that goes longitudinally up that way. That's the longitudinal portion of the electromagnetic wave, which is been predicted. That's the Boiler's pilot wave, PGA, pilot wave and everything. They're up there. But we can't detect them because they're in that space. We do detect it. It's the intuition part of our consciousness. Or if you like the paranormal, it's ESP. Same difference. Uh, James, if you were the single uh, field theory in the context of nuclear reactions, that slide you showed earlier, have you obtained any insight that might help explain the cold fusion phenomenon? I really haven't thought of that. I, I concentrate more on trying, trying to predict uh, decay particles. And I think with the decay particles, actually prediction of decay times, um, three-dimensional space is double polar Riemannian. The higher dimension fifth is single polar Riemannian. Time is hyperbolic. So if that curvature for some for energy conditions doesn't come and meet exactly the way it should, it falls short and there's a gap in going into the future along that curve, the same type of curve in the future. And then that would cause the particle to decay. I'm just trying to find a way to calculate that. I've only thought a little bit on the cold fusion problem, not a whole lot. Go ahead. Um. I think a lot of this is just fantastic. So, uh, well, thank you. In, in, in terms of the uh, geometric interpretation, but I'm wondering about the um, problem altogether of, of integrating uh, gravity and uh, electricity. And the reason really why is nature. because I heard an nature excellent. Nature is one, it's not a bunch of different things. <laughs> well, that may be it, but I heard a lecture by Feynman actually, came to visit Berkeley once. And he very carefully explained how all we ever measure is through electromagnetic instruments. And by projecting the electromagnetic instrument warps, if you will, yeah. you can talk in terms of space warps, you can talk in terms of curvatures and so on and so forth, but they're really just effects on the electromagnetic instrument. In other words, it's um, an interpretation. And I, I'm just, that solves I, the whole problem. I just, it? yeah, it solves the problem for a while, but it leads to other problems. You've got more and more point particles, more and more point particles. I, I hear, I used to make a joke that eventually someone to explain consciousness, so you're gonna invent a photon, a virtual particle called call the photon. Been joking about that for years. Or stupid on or something like that. Awesome. The guy in India did it about a month or two months ago. Awesome. To explain. You, you're just gonna have an explosion, you're gonna have an infinite number of particles. So there's no infinite number of particles you do if you go along with that view. 
What are they? One twenty-eight now, hundred thirty. Ten is the power uh, of, of the different particles, yeah. point molecules. Oh. Then all the supersymmetrics and everything. Particle zoo. Yeah, well, it is a zoo, and it's going to it's going to keep on going. You're going to have an infinite number of particles someday. It's yeah. it's it's Zeno's paradox for particles. You'll never reach it. Well, if you uh, if you only count particles that you can form a beam of and do experiments with, you're limited to forty-eight. Or if you look at my method, you only have four real particles. <laughs> Neutrinos, you have two of those, electron and proton. And that little old problem with there not being antiparticles in the universe disappears in 10 seconds. I can explain that to the inflation. And then you've got the neutron, which is electron, neutron, neutrino, or two neutrinos, and the proton stacked like that. And then all the rest of the particles are intermediate energy density patterns that almost fulfill the geometric conditions to be real, i.e. half spin, but don't make half spin. And so they decay immediately into things with that spin, because they're intermediate. They're not real particles. Time for about one or two short questions. Um, yeah. Uh, others have complained about physicists projecting onto symbolic entities in a theory uh, in, uh, in, in ontological substance. Huh? In other words, it may, may, one may have a theory in which there are three dimensions uh, encode what we observe in space, and then have a fourth dimension uh, that encodes something else, but one is not really justified in jumping to the conclusion that that fourth dimension is a fourth dimension equivalent to the other dimensions. It's not equivalent. Yeah. It's nothing it's like not, that. It might a, not be an it's ontological a thing. It's, it's the point they're making is it might not be an ontological thing at all. It may be just a gadget in the theory to systematize certain that's that actually that that's yeah, what that's right. that's it's one of the major complaints of against Deleuze's 1921 theory. Huh? But you can make that against any theory, really. Yeah, right. Of course level. you can, and that's the point. And it comes out. This is theory needs testing. This is a theory that it's a theory that needs systematizes it needs. observations, but it but doesn't help to describe. The thing is, it makes predictions. I've got yeah, several okay. predictions of dark matter, dark energy could easily be. But that doesn't mean there's dark matter and dark energy. Actually, those are both misnomers. It's not dark energy to begin with. It's potential. It's not potential energy, it's not kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. It is potential. It but doesn't energy, energy itself, until it interacts with matter. Energy itself is a bookkeeping concept. There's no such thing. You can't get a bucket of energy. Oh, <laughs> try, try, try to explain that to people who say everything is energy. I've tried to explain it to them, and you can't. They think everything is energy. No. Well, I know there's, you know, there's it's potential. The potential has to interact with matter to become energy. Which. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm out of time to do my second one on consciousness, I'm sorry. One last question. How does this uh, unification theory obviate the distinction between mind and matter? That's the, that's the talk that I was supposed to do, a short talk for 20 minutes, and that's exactly what that talk was about. So it does obviate it? Does it end the mind-matter distinction? Yeah, yeah that's mind-matter oh. And I explain exactly what consciousness I'm both, both, smart okay, I'm both, not, both, both this, point, both this one and my consciousness, both this PowerPoint and conscious one are at academic.edu. Uh -huh. So you go home and look at my So you, do, you did and discuss it. And the, pa the papers are <laughs> written, the preliminary papers are written, and they're at academic.edu as well as the VGA. So but if I do a keyword search, mind matter, will I find it? Or don't you use the words mind and matter? Uh, I mean, it's I don't know, I've, never, I've never searched on that. Huh? You might. Uh, I've gotten all kinds of weird searches. But that's on what Google the title of the talk papers. was in the last 20 minutes. I mean, if it, if it doesn't appear, if it appears in the title, I would think that you could appear in the text. He didn't the no, he said he did. He said last 20 minutes he spent. No, I have. I have another presentation. No, he has second presentation. presentation. That's what I, I mean. Will, I, didn't know, I, I don't have any. I don't have any concept of time up here. I started rattling off. Sorry about that. Well, I, you said I was supposed to have a second after this, but time has run out. I was not informed that time has run out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on the picture. Uh, I have a practical question. How, where do we park tomorrow? Yeah, he said he was going to uh, tell us after. To, uh, let's give Jim one final effort. <laughs>